Over two centuries ago, on the eve of the American Revolution, the people of Boston stood up to George III, the King of England. Not allowing themselves to be bullied or cowed, they inspired Americans with their courage and determination. Last week, how many of you saw the people of Boston do exactly the same thing? Stand up against a common enemy, not allowing themselves to be cowed or bullied, inspiring and moving the people of this country by their courage and determination. How many of you saw that last week? So did I. I saw the same thing. But I, um, I have to say that I think the patriots in 1776 living in Boston would be very proud to see their descendants today. I want to also say there's something else that we can be proud of in looking at what's going on with the bomber in Boston, and that is this. The proce due process and the rule of law will be honored. He will be treated with respect and courtesy regardless of what happens. Even if he's eventually executed, he will be given good medical treatment. He'll be given good lawyers. He is going to be treated quite well during this period. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. And I think it speaks well for our society that we choose to treat the accused of that, give them that kind of treatment. This is a picture of what happened. Many of you have seen this as a picture that went viral. It's a SWAT guy and he went to a home and saw how they were doing in the lockdown and a child called out and said, we're out of milk for our cereal. We need milk. And he went out and probably with his own money he bought this milk and brought it to them. Which brings me to my second point and that is a common theme I've been sharing with all of you is that America, American history is the history not of extraordinary people, but ordinary people who do what? Extraordinary things. That's right. But I think as we see what went on in Boston last week, we also realize that that's not only American history, that's today. And as I get to know the students at this school, I have to say that I believe that's America's past, that's America's present, and that's America's future as well. Now, <clears throat> I want us to start and by uh, talking about the Civil War and the state of America in 1865 when the Civil War ended. I want to begin by uh, sharing, well, by the way, what we're going to do is cover the first half of this information on Reconstruction now and then the second half next week. Uh, we're going to talk about what the United States was like in 1865 at the end of the Civil War. We're going to talk about the challenges that were faced in reconstructing this country after that war. And we're going to talk about the election of 1876 and why Reconstruction ended in 1877. Um, but let's begin by, by, I'm going to start by telling you a story that um, happened to me 18 years ago, so you'll get a little understanding of what it was like for the people in 1865 after the Civil War. 18 years ago, I was invited to dinner with a lawyer friend of mine at his home, and he had three young children. One of them was about one, years, one year old. And so we had dinner, and I didn't pay much attention to the child, and a week later, I heard that child had died of a seizure. And I sent him a sympathy card, and, and I felt kind of bad. And I saw him in court about three months later. And I went to him and I said, asked him how his wife was doing. And he said, oh, you know, I just saw, last night I got up in the middle of the night and she was in the bathroom throwing up in the toilet. Now that is a common physical reaction that people have when someone close to them dies. And uh, that's perfectly common. It would be common, for example, if someone loses a child, it would be common that they would throw up before they went to bed, they'd sleep through the night, and they'd get up and throw up in the morning, usually dry heaves. There's nothing there. That's what extreme grief does to people. Now, what does that have to do with the Civil War? Simply this. Between 1861 and 1865, at the Battle of Antietam, at the Battle of Gettysburg, at the Battle of Fredericksburg, at the Battle of Cold Harbor, the Battle of Shiloh, at the Battle of Chickamauga, 
Every time there was a major battle during the Civil War, shortly thereafter, all over this country, thousands and thousands of mothers, fathers, sweethearts, fiancés, young wives, children about your age would literally throw up time and again because they would never see that father, husband, son who they loved so much. They would never see him again. And when they realize that, that's the physical reaction. Why do I say that is relevant? Because there was much for America to forgive. There was much to ask forgiveness for. Because this wasn't some foreign power. Americans had done that to Americans in America. And that's basically, you have to understand that before you can understand some of the challenges of Reconstruction. Now, can you, you can all understand, just on the bloodshed, and I'm going to talk about more, there'd be a lot of bitterness. You all understand that. Well, Mr. Tooley and I, when we were young, when we were children about your age, we were in the South at different times. I was in Georgia. He was in Kentucky. And he'll tell you, right, Mr. Tooley, that the bitterness of the Civil War still existed 100 years after that war ended. No doubt. Yeah. There, it was there was still bitterness. Now, now we're 150 years out of the Civil War, and that bitterness is pretty much healed. But up to a century later after the Civil War, there was still bitterness. I want you to look at this next slide. In, 19, in 1860, the value of slaves was $2 billion. In 1860, the value of railroads was $700 million. So the value of railroads, one of the major capital investments, was only one-third that of slaves. How big do you think the federal government was then? The value of slaves was about $2 billion. What do you think the annual expenditures of the federal government might be in relationship to that? The federal government expenditures were only $60 million a year, which gives you an idea how small the federal government was in terms of the relationship of uh, slaves. What does that say about American society in 1860? What does that say to you guys? What, what kind of things, conclusions can you draw looking at that in terms of what society was like, Matthew? We really depended on slaves, yeah. But the thing I, point I wanted to make is you can really see that if slavery ends, there's going to be some major changes coming to America when slavery ended. This is William Tecumseh Sherman. He was the second in command. He was just under Ulysses Grant as general. And he was uh, taught in Louisiana at a military academy prior to the war. He said, the South cannot be made to love us, but we can make war so terrible a thousand years will pass before they resort to it as a way of resolving differences. He had some other interesting things to say about the war, and I want you to look carefully at this. He said, this war differs from other wars in this particular. We are not fighting armies, but a hostile people, and must make old and young, rich and poor, feel the hard hand of war. Now, he believed in total war. This, this is a, a famous painting, and it's on board a riverboat at City Point, Virginia. It was uh, a painted by a great painter, and it's a great painting, and it's pretty accurate. This is probably just poetic. Uh, he threw that in a rainbow. But it's probably pretty much how the meeting looked between Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, and Admiral Porter. These were three men who were absolutely committed to saving the Union. They were committed to total war. They were also committed to a compassionate reconstruction. That's the first question on your worksheet. Compassionate reconstruction. They wanted to see a compassionate reconstruction done on the South. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Yet it seems almost a contradiction in terms, but they wanted to see a total war. Now, let me tell you what a total war looks like. When they in, in, in the times before the Civil War, what would happen would be large armies would go around and get in battles, and a lot of people would die in the battles, and that would be it. There wasn't really a movement against the civilian population. However, in order to, for an army to exist, don't you think an army needs a lot of support from the civilian base? 
You see what I'm saying? An army needs to get what from, from the civilian population? They need to get what? Food. Food. They sure do. What else do they need? Clothes, uniforms, guns. They need to get feed for their horses. In fact, an army of 100,000 men requires, on a daily basis, Mr. Tooley, a bit of interesting trivia, a 100,000-man army needs 120,000 tons of supplies a day. Yeah. So it's huge. You can't get that kind of stuff if you don't have a civilian population which is giving the people, um, excuse me, 100 and, no, it's, I need, they need 120 tons of supplies a day, a 100,000 man army, that's right. You don't get that kind of support, uh, you don't get that kind of supplies unless you have a, a civilian population that's giving them food and giving them clothing and giving them money and whatever they need to continue fighting. Soldiers need to be paid, they need to get money from the civilian population. Do you see, all see that? So if we go after the civilian population, maybe that's the most humane thing to do. I'm going to ask you guys this. Do you think an argument could be made that instead of just going out after the army and killing people, what if we go in and we destroy the farms that feed the army? Do you see what I'm saying? The Shenandoah Valley was the breadbasket of the Confederacy. What if we send the cavalry down under Phil Sheridan and we, and we destroy all these farms who with their food supplies and their crops are feeding the Confederate Army? What do you think of that? What if we send an army down to go through and tear up their railroads? What do you guys think of that? How do railroads help the army? Transportation. Transportation of what? Transportation of supplies and transportation of? True, yeah, men. So men and supplies, Angela, that is absolutely right. Men and supplies are important to be moved around, and so if we tear up their railroads, that's not going to happen. Well, let me also s mention uh, two other things. The first is the blockade. A blockade you're going to learn about when you read your chapter was along the Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, ships went down, and ships blockaded the South from sending or receiving important supplies to continue the war. But the other thing are slaves. Do you see how if you free slaves, is that going to hurt the, uh, the uh, war effort for the Confederacy? Does that make sense? Now, how about this? How about if we don't only free the slaves, but what if we give them muskets? What if they, we give them guns so that they can join the army and shoot, other, shoot the, their uh, former owners? What do you think of that? Do you think, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it's not only freeing the slaves, because that slave is working on a farm, creating food, growing food. And so that means the person who owns that slave can go off and do what now? If, 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 a, if a slave grows food, that means his master now has the freedom to go and do what? Join the army. That's right. So that was one of the main reasons of... Um, that was one of the main reasons of freeing the slaves was because they wanted to undermine and destroy the ability of the Confederacy to uh, conduct war. Look carefully at this picture. Oh, but by the way, do you guys understand how that might be uh, a, an, argument as, as a, an argument for compassion and mercy total war? that we go after the civilian base and cut off their ability to, to feed their army and so forth and destroy their infrastructure. And that's actually a more compassionate thing to do than just having uh, armies killing each other in huge number. Does that make sense? <laughs> However, if you're one of those civilians that sees your farm being burned, do you think you're going to agree with that? No. But, but you just got to understand the arguments, and I think they're good. Let's try to get an understanding for the big differences between the North and the South. Between 1860 and 1870, the gross domestic production of the North increased 50%. Why was that? Well, it, it was because of technology. You've perhaps heard of the, have you guys heard of the McCormick Reaper and some of the uh, technology and, and the implements of the industrial age that they really used to implement on the farms to grow yeah. things? Have they learned about that? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, well, you're going to learn about it. So it was uh, the technology helped. 
In, between 1860 and 1870, the gross domestic production of the South decreased 60 percent. Now, what that means is in 1860, with the exception of the slaves in the South, which numbered about 4 million, they were the poorest in the South, obviously, but if you were in the South in 1860, you wouldn't see a, a, a disparity. They were doing very well. The white people in the South were doing very well in 1860, and they were actually wealthier than the North, Northern whites. What happened by 1870? What did that look like? How, do, you, do you see the difference in the poverty between the North and the South? How long do you think that lasted? Um, the Civil War, do you see what it would do, looking at these numbers, what that would do in terms of the wealth disparity between the North and the South? Do you guys see that? How long do you think that was last? Does anybody want to conjecture how long would it take? Because today, by the way, today there's not a big income disparity between the North and the South. It's, there's been a lot of equalization. How long do you think it would take after the Civil War for the South to come back and be economically thriving once again. Yes? Brandon, 50 years. Yeah, it would seem 50 years would be plenty of time, wouldn't it? That's good, Brandon. Thanks. Brandon, it took about 120 years for the South to come back. <laughs> but I agree with you. I wouldn't think it would take 120 years for the South to really come back, but that's about how long it did. Before the South really had rebuilt itself and found itself economically thriving once again. It was about 120 years. Um, now, I want you to look carefully at these pictures. I've mentioned that they went in and they started ripping up the infrastructure, the railroads. These were called Sherman's bow ties. And what they would do is the Yankee soldiers would go in and take these, these railroad um, rails and then they would make the molten hot in the center and then they would bend them around uh, trees and they would twist them in a way that they could never ever be used on railroads again. So they could just leave them there and they were utterly and completely worthless and useless by the South. Do you think, how do you think the South felt about that? when they had their infrastructure torn up. Do you understand how the South would be pretty angry about that? Do you, by the way, did, did this uh, happen in the North? Did this kind of destruction take place in the North? Here's a picture, a real picture of the, uh, of the railroad tie parties. Why is it that we didn't see this sort of destruction in the North? Does anyone know? Why is it it was the South who experienced <laughs> this and not the North? Come on, you guys. How many of you went to Gettysburg? A lot of you went to Gettysburg. Monty Brooks uh, was able to uh, give us the answer, so think about it. Why is it the North did not experience the destruction to their infrastructure that the South experienced? Yes, Angela. Uh, it wasn't because they had uh, a better, <laughs> a better um, like the land was like in their, um, like in their, like, they're, like, it was hard to get over their land. We were, like, rocks and stuff and, like, hills. Well, okay. You guys, I think going to Gettysburg, you guys maybe didn't appreciate something really unique about Gettysburg. And, and maybe you missed this when you were at Gettysburg, and here's what it is. Gettysburg is one of the very few times, it was only one of two times that the South invaded the North. They only invaded the North when they went into Antietam, they crossed over Virginia into Maryland, and then that was just a few miles in. Then they were turned back. Now, Gettysburg was a lot further down, a lot further into the north than Antietam. But that was the only invasion, really, uh, from the south into the north was Gettysburg. So that was just one singular invasion. It took a couple of weeks. And other than that, the north really didn't have the south tearing up its infrastructure. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why the south experienced that in such a major way that the South experienced that destruction. I want you to look carefully at this. This picture, if I didn't tell you it was taken after the Civil War, you would think that it might be in England. You might think the Luftwaffe to drop bombs over it. Do you see the total destruction in, the, in this city? Do you see that? Doesn't it look like airplanes must have flown over and bombed this place? Americans did this to Americans in America. 
and it was the northerners for the most part who did this to the southern cities. They were utterly and completely destroyed. This is a um, picture of Richmond. Here's another picture of a, of a desolate city. This is another picture, okay? This is done through artillery and firing on it. Fires started and then being, hitting it with artillery and they destroyed these cities. Do you think a city like this is going to be uh, producing much uh, wealth for the armies, much supplies for the armies? No. Um, now, I want you to look at this man carefully. His name was J.P. Morgan. He was a New York financier. He was a multi, multi millionaire. And he invested enormous amounts of money in the South during the period of Reconstruction to help rebuild their railroads. I want you to look carefully at his face. I want you to try to imagine things about his character looking at a picture, which is sort of dangerous to do, but I want you to look carefully at it and tell me why do you think he invested his money, millions of dollars, to help rebuild the Southern Railroads? Yes, Matthew. Uh, because that's where he made a lot of money? No, he got his money from the North mostly. Why did he take his money and invest it in Southern Railroads, ladies and gentlemen? Think, why would he do that? Yes, Cameron. Um, they, he, wanted his, the railroad named after him. he wanted the railroad named after him. Julian. Does this guy look like a Mother Teresa figure? Yeah. Is this the kind of guy? What does he look like? If if you judge by his face and everything, what does he look like? Yes, well, Charlie. Can I answer the question? Yeah, answer the my. Yes, exactly. He did it. He did it for profit. Okay, now I want you to imagine for a minute that prior to the Civil War, they had a lot of the railroads. Some of the railroads, like in Georgia, Georgia invested a lot of its money in the railroads. And so what happened was the profits from the railroad were kept within the South. Now, with the northern financiers coming and investing money into the railroads, what's going to happen to those profits? They're going to go where? They're going to head north. That's right. Those profits are going to go north. So I want you all to understand why southerners might be a little bitter about this. Let's look at this. In 1869, a Harvard professor said, that the war had opened a great gulf between what happened before in our century and what has happened since, or what is likely to happen hereafter. It does not seem to me as if I were living in the country in which I was born. In a sense, it really shows this quote, you know, that in a sense you could almost argue that America really began in 1865. Because the country, the United States of America, if we say it started in, 18, in 1776, when the uh, Declaration of Independence was written, or we said that it started in 1787 when the Constitution was written, really America began in, in, in 1865 after the Civil War because that was a very, very different America than existed prior to that time. And the questions that they had was this. Should the South be punished? Should the South be forgiven? What should the status of the freedmen be? What of the cost to the North? These are issues that they had to face. Let's talk about this for a minute. Should the South be punished? Should the South be forgiven? Okay, I've explained a lot to you about understanding why the Southerners could be so angry and upset with the Northerners and why it might take them a hundred years to really get over, get over the whole thing. Their country, the way they saw it, their country was invaded. I want to talk for a few minutes about why the North was so angry with the South because they were pretty angry too and they had some things to be angry about. Why do you think the North could be so angry with Southerners for this war? Why, why would they be angry? 
Does anybody want to give me some ideas? Yes. A lot of people died, Brandon. A lot of, you, you know, the, the North lost a lot of people. But the South lost actually proportionally mu much more. But yeah, a, a lot of dead, but also philosophically, okay? Here's the thing. Let me explain. Our nation at that time was only about 87 years old. And when, when the Founding Fathers got together, when they declared independence, when they wrote the Constitution, this was an experiment in representative democracy, okay? The rest of the world looked to us as a modern example of representative democracy. They'd had democracies that didn't work out in Greece, in Rome. They'd had democracies before, but this was the first modern democracy. And it was to be an example to the world. And so we were very conscious of the fact that the world was looking to the United States of America to see how we did with that. So how did it work out in 1860 when the South ended the Union and walked away from the Union like children throwing down their toys? They walked away and said, we're not happy that Abraham Lincoln was elected president. We don't want to be a Union where Abraham Lincoln's the president. The Union said, well, you know, Abraham Lincoln was elected under the Constitution. He was perfectly elected president of the United States under our Constitution. And you're unhappy with it, so you're throwing down your toys and walking away. Now, if we've got the whole world looking at us as to representative democracy being successful or not successful, what does that say about representative government? What does it say? Yeah, it's basically saying to the world, hey, you know what? Maybe dictatorships aren't so bad. Maybe kings and queens aren't so bad. Maybe emperors aren't so bad after all. Because we can't seem to get along here. Anyway, that's the way the Union saw the South leaving. Does that make sense to you? If you were a Union person, you'd call them a good word might be traitor. They were traitors. This was Thaddeus Stevens, a Reconstruction radical. I'll be talking about him more at this point. answer to question number of what number? Four. Number four. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Lincoln? Raise your hand if you've seen the movie. Oh, most of you. Oh, this is good. You guys, a lot more of you have seen it than the other class. Yes. Tell me who played Thaddeus Stevens in the movie Lincoln. Nobody's gotten this today. Yeah, come on, you guys. Who played, what movie actor played Thaddeus Stevens? Oh. Tommy Lee Jones. Lee Jones, you got it. Tommy Lee Jones. Now, I think Tommy Lee Jones played Thaddeus Stevens brilliantly, and you'll see why in a moment. And I think Tommy Lee Jones is really a character. And I think he was probably really excited when he read about the life of Thaddeus Stevens. He was excited about playing him. And I think he did a brilliant job playing him. Because they were both characters. But listen carefully. Thaddeus Stevens believed that the South should be punished. Those of you who saw the movie, wouldn't you agree Thaddeus Stevens really thought the South should be punished for the Civil War, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he believed in, in, in some, well, they called him a radical for a reason. This is what he said, Reconstruction must revolutionize, oh, let me see. Yeah, Reconstruction must revolutionize Southern institutions, habits and manners. The foundations of their institutions must be broken up and relayed, or all our blood and treasure will have been spent in vain. The foundations of, our, of their institutions must be broken up and relayed. That sounds pretty radical, doesn't it? Going into a society and breaking up their foundations, does that seem like a guy who wants a little revenge? And I'll tell you something else about him. I love this quote. And this is the kind of stuff that you see when Tommy Lee Jones was playing him. This is just a quote that sums it all up. When he was speaking in front of the Senate, a guy from Delaware walked in, one of the Senator, Delaware, uh, Senator from Delaware walk, walk, walks in, and he says, I'm going to pause while the member from Delaware slinks across the floor of this chamber and adheres to his seat by his own slime. Pretty strong words, huh? Anyway, he was not interested in being everybody's friend, as you can tell. 
Now I want to talk about Democrats and Republicans. You guys all know the difference, right? In this last election between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, did you think there was kind of like some negativity going on, a lot of negative stuff? Do you all feel that way? You do not know negativity politically until you listen to the stuff they've said in history. We are so respectful and kind to each other compared to what they've been in the past, you have no idea. Let me, now, the Democratic Party was the party that lost the Civil War. The, the South at that time was mostly Democrat. And in the North, the Democrats were collaborators. They really didn't want to fight the Civil War particularly. And those who did weren't that interested in freeing the slaves. The Democrats were not interested in punishing the South at all. They weren't interested in changing the South particularly. Listen carefully to what Governor Oliver Morton of Indiana said in 1866. He said, every unregenerate rebel calls himself a Democrat. Every bounty hunter, every sneak who ran away from the draft calls himself a Democrat. Every man who murdered Union prisoners by cruelty and starvation calls himself a Democrat. Every New York rioter in 1863 who burned up little children in colored asylums, who robbed, ravished, and murdered indiscriminately calls himself a Democrat. In short, the Democratic Party may be described as a common sewer into which is emptied every element of inhumanity and barbarism which has discolored the age. Did you hear anything like that in the election between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama? That was pretty strong words they used, weren't they here? That's the way they talked. Uh, it was take no prisoners. Uh, now, I want you to look carefully at this man, his name is Andrew Johnson, and he is considered to be Abraham Lincoln's biggest mistake. But he's an interesting man in a lot of ways. He was a tailor, and he was an illiterate tailor. And uh, he actually, he, uneducated, but he had a lot of really good qualities because he went from being an illiterate tailor to going and becoming president of the United States. So he obviously has some qualities that you have to admire. He was a senator from Tennessee, and Tennessee went with the South for the most part. Uh, some people in Tennessee went with the North, some went with the South. He stayed with the North, and he was an honest union man. He was a committed union man, and he, he was very much a racist. He did not like blacks. He didn't want to help them particularly. Why did Abraham Lincoln ki kick uh, Hannibal Hamlin, was the uh, vice president under Abraham Lincoln from 1861 to 1865? Yet Lincoln dropped... Uh, uh, um, his vice president, and he reached out and took this man, who was a senator from Tennessee, and put him into the vice presidency, which seems like an odd thing, don't you think, for Abraham Lincoln to do? Doesn't it? Because uh, he was really happy with his other vice president, but there was actually a good reason. Lincoln was afraid he might lose the election in 1864, and he wanted to get somebody who might bring over a lot of votes for the Democrats, who had remained loyal to the Union. The Union Democrats, they called him. And he had been a Democrat, Andrew Johnson. So by bringing him in as the Vice President, Lincoln felt he would have a better chance of winning in 1864. It turned out Lincoln did not need to do that. He would have won with uh, uh, Hannibal Hamlin. But anyway, Andrew Johnson became President. And upon Lincoln's assassination, uh, he, he, as I said, he became President. Um, by the way, I learned something Mr. Tooley taught me. Um, I knew that he was illiterate and didn't learn to read until later in life, but uh, the one who taught him to read was his wife, uh, Mr. Tooley pointed out to me. True story, his wife taught him to read. Now, I want you to look at this picture. This is a, a picture of the Freeman. Look at the background here. Does this look like this uh, city that there is behind them is in good shape? Okay. These were the poorest of the poor. It's said that the freedmen, the freedmen came into freedom with nothing but freedom. They had nothing but freedom. They didn't even know how to read, and I'm going to explain why that was the case in a moment. 
So these were the poorest of the poor. And um, it's a fact that it was illegal in many southern states prior to the Civil War to teach slaves to read. And this is why they were illiterate. They were not taught to read. Now, I'm going to uh, just share this with you and see if you guys uh, can understand this completely. There's a good reason why they were not taught to read. What was the biggest fear that the slave owners had when it came to their slaves? What was the biggest fear they had? Oh, they would learn like, values and they would learn like, other things and then get smart enough to run away. Well, how about if they would rise up in a slave revolt and kill their masters? Do you think that might have been something that would concern them? If you owned a bunch of people you were exploiting and you owned you own them and you treated them brutally, wouldn't them rising up and killing you be something that might concern you just a little bit? Okay. Now, that is not a principle that applies only to the slave owners. Do you think there's a reason in North Korea, which is the most brutal dictatorship in the world, do you think there's a reason they don't allow the internet there? Okay. When we look at what's called the Arab Spring in the Middle East, this revolt of people going against oppressive governments. That all happens when people have the ability to communicate. Do you guys appreciate how social media has created a world where people are moving <laughs> against oppressive governments? Does that make sense to you? So the, so the electronic age has created open doors where oppressive governments have a lot more to worry about. Now, if somebody's owned slaves, wouldn't a good way to keep them from rising up in an organized fashion against you, wouldn't a good way to keep that from happening would be to keep them from learning to read? That way, the slaves in the other plantation can't give messages to your slaves, right? If you're going to own people and treat them brutally and oppress them, I don't want them reading. I don't want them communicating with the other slaves in the other plantations. That's just common sense. Do you see what I'm saying? It isn't a matter of saying we want to be mean to you guys. I want to protect myself. If I'm going to treat people the way the dictatorship of North Korea treats its people, I don't want them having the internet. You know what I mean? That's why slaves weren't allowed to um, be taught to read. Now. Um, This is a picture of the Freedmen's Bureau. It's a cartoon, a, a, a drawing about the Freedmen's Bureau that was in a newspaper. And this guy represents the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was passed over the veto of Andrew Johnson. He did not want the Freedmen's Bureau to come into existence because he didn't want to spend the money and he didn't care that much about the blacks. He didn't care that much about the former slaves. What do you see in this picture? Who's protecting who from whom? The Freedmen's Bureau is protecting who here? Who is, is he protecting in this picture? Yes. He's protecting the former <laughs> slaves. And these folks want to brutalize them. So the Freedmen's Bureau, this is just an example, is trying to create um, a scenario where the people are protected, the slaves, the former slaves are protected from their former owners. Well. This is a picture of an example of teaching the uh, slaves. They would go down. This woman is probably from New York or Massachusetts, and she was with the Freeman's Bureau. She comes down, and they'd have classes on reading. This is a real picture of, you see, look at the ages here. They had young adults here. These people didn't know how to read, and, and they were being taught how to read by people in the Freedmen's Bureau. What does Andrew Johnson think of the Freedmen's Bureau based on this cartoon? Question number six. What does he think? By the way, what does this look like to you? What, what would you call this piece of furniture? Huh? One class got it. Isn't this called a bureau? Isn't that called a bureau? You guys got it now that I told you. Uh, it's pretty obvious. This is called a bureau. And what is he doing to the bureau? By the way, the, you see the little black stick figures, the black figures here? He's kicking the, what are you laughing about? It makes total sense. It makes total sense. Now, now listen though. 
He's kicking this bureau and, and, and the veto, okay? So he really didn't want the Freedmen's Bureau to come into existence. Congress passed the law funding and creating the Freedmen's Bureau to help free slaves. Andrew Johnson vetoed that. And then how did Congress overcome that? They passed it over his veto with a two-thirds vote. So that just shows you some of the tension and anxiety and antagonisms that existed between <coughs> Andrew Johnson and Congress. One of the big challenges that was faced during Reconstruction is who was responsible for implementing Reconstruction policies in the South? In bringing the South back into the Union, whose responsibility would it be? Would it be primarily the President by by ordering executive decrees and bringing the South back in on his terms? Or would it be Congress who made those decisions? You say, well, how about the Constitution? What does the Constitution say about it? I got news for you. When they wrote the Constitution, it was totally off their radar screen that there would ever be a civil war or there would ever be reconstruction. So the Constitution really doesn't give us a lot of guidance as to who should be primarily responsible for Reconstruction. And so what happened was, understandably, there was friction and anxiety and uh, antagonism between the President, Andrew Johnson, and Congress because they had a different vision as to how the South should be reconstructed.